Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Light of the World. I'm Andre Sloan. I'm John Keller. And today we have a special guest with us tonight, Archfree Serge Lukyanov from New Jersey. Father, could you start us the prayer? Слава тебе, Боже наш, слава тебе, Царю Небесный, Утешителю души истины, и же везде сыся исполняя, сокровище благих и жизни подателю, приди и вселисевны, и очистины от всякие скверны, и спаси блаже души наша. Аминь. Father, you're a well-known figure in Rokor, a graduate of our seminary. What, what, what year was it again? 1981. 1981. So everyone in Rokor knows you just like that. But people perhaps outside of our jurisdiction might, might want to know more about you. Could you tell us about your past, your lineage, where you serve, and who you are? Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. It's always a joy to come to Holy Trinity Monastery where I spent uh, three beautiful years of my life from 1978 to 1981. I'm very blessed uh, that uh, I'm the fifth generation of priests in my family. My father is the late uh, Proto-Presbyter Valery Lukianov, who uh, was quite renowned in the Orthodox Church. He was uh, the last priest uh, who was ordained by St. John of Maximovich of San Francisco. And we always had a very close bond with St. John and because uh, my father was born in Shanghai, China. Oh. And he was his altar boy. And when Vlandika came to America and he brought the Russian immigrants through the islands of Tubabao in Philippines, many Russians came to San Francisco and New York City, my father came with St. John. So in New York City, uh, when he met my mother, uh, St. John would come to our home. And as a young boy, I remember Vladika coming to our home and we were always very excited. I was quite young then and Vladika was very loving. So we would sit on his lap and Vladika would pat us on the head and he would kiss us and hug us. And uh, we felt that warmth uh, coming from Vladika John. Uh, I'm very blessed because my grandfather was also a priest in Rokor, uh, Archpriest Peter Macharsky. He was serving in New York City, in Queens. Uh, my great-grandfather was a Vasily Bogoslavsky, uh, who was serving uh, in Ukraine and then in Russia. And my pra, pra dedushka, my great-great-grandfather, was Pratadyakon Hrysanv. And I was uh, very blessed that uh, when I was ordained a priest, the silver cross that was given to me was uh, the same cross was ordained was my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my father, and myself. So that same cross was ordained by all four of us. Uh, I was born on Annunciation, and uh, my mother was singing at my grandfather's church in New York City. Uh, she received Holy Communion, and that evening uh, I decided to come out. And uh, I always had the special blessing from the Mother of God because I felt I was born in Annunciation. And as a young little uh, prisluznik, as a young altar boy with, from my grandfather, I would be constantly going through the royal doors. And uh, my grandfather said, uh, uh, you're definitely going to become a priest because you keep on going through the royal doors. And uh, sure enough, he was right. But um, in 1975, when I was a young man, I went to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage. I was only 17 years old. I was in my, my senior year in high school. And uh, we had a beautiful uh, young group of pilgrims that went with us. And when I got to, we went through Europe, and then we got to Jerusalem, I got very ill in Jerusalem. And I started getting these uh, very bad headaches, and the left side of my face was hurting, and my ear was hurting about the day before I was supposed to leave. And the uh, last day we were supposed to leave, I went to the Gethsemane uh, convent, and I was standing in the church, and all of a sudden I lost consciousness. I woke up in one of the cells of the sisters and they were putting holy oil on me and I had these horrible pains in my head. Then the van pulled up and we had to go to the airport so 
I ran up and got into the van. And by the time we got on the airplane and flying to New York City, I wasn't able to walk uh, or stand up, and I had to lay on three seats. And my left side of my face went paralyzed by the time I got to New York City, and I wasn't able to walk off the plane. So this was quite a view as all the pilgrims were, we had 17 of us, and we're coming off the plane, and all the parents were there, and I was being carried out uh, on a stretcher. And my mother uh, greeted me that way uh, at the airport. And somehow they got me into a wheelchair, got me into the car, and drove me to Lakewood, where we were living, where my father's parish was, of St. Alexander Nevsky. And they took me to the hospital and uh, didn't know what happened, what was going on. And uh, my whole face was sagging and uh, had this horrible, horrible pain in my ear. And... um, they realized that I had meningitis and that something had crawled into my ear and bit me and gave me meningitis, which of course is, uh, uh, could be very fatal. It's the infection of the brain. And they took me to Philadelphia Hospital, to a specialty hospital, and I was very, very ill. And my dedoshka, my grandfather, uh, Father Peter, who was alive at the time, he ran to synod and went to Metropolitan Philaret and says, please, can we have the Kursk icon? My grandson is very ill, dying. And uh, the doctor said, there's nothing we can do. It's just too late. You waited too long, and the anti- antibiotics are not taking, and they needed to prepare my parents that I would die. And uh, Dietushka came with my father and my mother, and he comes and he's carrying the Kursk Mother of God icon. And they told him, oh, you have to put on a white mask and gloves and, you know, we don't know what this is. Uh, maybe something contagious from the Middle East. And Yadushka, in his broken English, says, no, 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 I have Mother of God with me, in his broken English. And he started to pray and he told me, he says, grandson, take the Mother of God in your hands and start to pray. And as you know, the Kursk icon is very heavy. I was very weak, and I was able to take her into her hands, and I, I held her closely, and I said, Boshri uh, Matir, Mother of God, if you give me life, I will serve you. And uh, three weeks later, I was out of the hospital, and I was completely well, but my paralysis remained on my face. And I was going back to high school, uh, my senior year, And for months I was walking around with this crooked face and my eye was all opened and it was quite a sight as a first senior in high school. And uh, I, we prayed and we we tried and doctors said that maybe we can do an operation of the brain and my father said, no, 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 no operations. And uh, about uh, seven or eight months passed and one of the nuns from Gethsemane uh, went to the Holy Sepulchre and they were all praying for me and as she came to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem uh, 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 some kind of nun came to her she never saw her and she hands an icon to her and she says to her you know what to do with this icon and uh, she looked at the icon it was St. Nectarius of Egina in Pentapolis and when she looked up the nun was gone she immediately packed up the icon and sent it to America. And when I opened the package, I saw it's St. Nectarius. Oh, I was there. I was in Egina with this group. And I remember I had oil of him. And I went and I put this icon on my icon corner. And I took the oil of St. Nectarius and I put it all over my face. And I prayed to St. Nectarius. And I woke up in the morning and I I smiled for the first time in nine months. And I ran out, Mama, Papa, look, I can smile. And we ran to the church and had a Thanksgiving Malibu, and I was healed by St. Nectarius. So the Mother of God healed me, and then St. Nectarius healed me. And I said, if I ever have a son, he'll be Nectari. And I have a son. His name is Nectari. And I have another son and three more daughters, thank God. And uh, I realized that I needed to serve the Lord because they gave me life. How did you come about that path, finding your vocation? Mother of God, 
healed me. And I promised her if she healed me, I would serve her and her son. So no matter what, you were intent on sticking to your word. Absolutely. Especially after St. Nectarius. And that's why I said I have to go to the seminary. And my father was very happy, of course. Uh, he was a priest. And I remember him driving me up here for the first time. And uh, he said to me in the car, he says, now forget your will. <laughs> You're now going to become like a monk. Be obedient. Be at the services. And listen to everything that the monks tell you. That's a lot more softer than what my mom said. <laughs> what, what did she say? Uh, I remember before she left, she said, don't embarrass me. So, well, it's a, <laughs> it's a little bit more direct. You know I, how she is. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. I know your mom went well. She's a wonderful lady. And that's how I, I got to Holy Trinity uh, Monastery. Of course, I came as a summer boy before that. And I remember Archbishop of Yerki Tawashiv and all the wonderful, wonderful monks that were that were here and Bishop Dolores. And of course, there was such an impact, you know, that they had. And when I came in 1978, there were so many wonderful old monks here. Uh, St. Pantaleim and St. Uh, uh, Father Pantaleim and, and, and Father Kiparian and Father Serge and Father Gennati. And, and, and the list goes on and the list goes on. Father Job and Father Floor. And all of these people have a just great impact on me. I was just amazed how, how hardworking they were. And even after a long, long day, they were still there at five o'clock in the morning at the service, you know, the next morning and going to liturgy. And uh, that's how I started my, my road uh, to becoming a clergyman. Wow. Um, along that road, have you ever had a point where you look back and you were like, I don't know, I don't know if I made the right choice or was it always, no matter what, 100%, you know, I'm here, this is the right thing, I, I don't regret it. Well, I'll tell you, my friend, um, as soon as I finished um, seminary, well, I should say the last year uh, before I finished seminary, um, God sent me uh, a beautiful woman. And uh, my, my future wife used to come to the monastery all the time as a pilgrim. And her, um, her spiritual father was here at Archimandrit Antoni, a very holy, holy man. He was one of the confessors of the monastery. And he really set her, like her foundation, you know, for spirituality. And sure enough, uh, you know, I see this nice looking woman in the confessional line. Uh, and I'm in the confessional line. And instead of thinking of my sins, of course, I'm looking at this uh, very pretty woman. And I said, gee, that looks very nice there. <laughs> and sure enough, I, uh, you know, I, I got to know her. And she had a, such a beautiful heart. Her name is Nuba. And uh, we fell in love. And I told my dad, I said, I, I found this wonderful woman. And uh, I wanted to get married. And he said, uh, absolutely. But I don't bless you to get married until you finish seminary. Get your education out of the way. And then you get married. So I, got, I finished seminary in June of 1981. And uh, in August... On August 9th, uh, the same year, I married my wife on St. Pantaleman's Day and St. Herman of Alaska Day, August 9th. Uh, and we had a wonderful, wonderful wedding with a lot of, a lot of seminarians, a lot of people, and over 500 guests oh, at wow. the reception. And uh, the family cooked all their, own, all their own food. This was uh, quite a wedding. Uh, there was a huge wedding in England at that time with Princess Diana and, uh, well, now the King Charles. Uh, and then there was a big wedding here in Lakewood and every possible Russian was there. And <laughs> so we had quite a, quite a celebration. And um, a few months later, uh, I was ordained uh, by Metropolitan Philaret, a very holy man. I'm so blessed to have him, him bless me. And uh, the day he ordained me, in our old church of St. Alexander Nevsky. And uh, he took me by the hand and he said, um, young deacon, never forget, never forget that St. Seraphim and people like St. Sergius, when they were serving as deacons, they saw the holy angels flying about the holy table and they saw fire coming out from the Holy Chalice. And as a deacon, you are representing the people 
and taking all the petitions of the people and giving them to the priests, and the priest is giving them to the Lord. So it's a very important role being a deacon to assist the priest in everything. And uh, God had granted me a, a good ear and a good voice, so I loved serving and uh, always loved to serve in, in pitch, in tone. You directed our choir here at one point, right? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, that was uh, uh, when I, was, I came to the seminary. Uh, after one year, there was a, a priest here, Father uh, Alexei Rosenthal, and he was conducting the seminary choir. And all of a sudden, he was elevated to become a priest, and they sent him to Australia. So Vladika Laver called me into his office, and he goes, No, that's Sergei. He used to speak that way. He goes, uh, You sing nice. <laughs> and you're going to now conduct uh, the seminary choir, and you're going to conduct uh, the Kdiros uh, six days a week, Monday through Saturday. And on Saturday, I want to antiphonal seminary choir Saturday morning. I said, well, Vladika, благословите, bless. And I started conducting the choir. And then on the holidays and the Sundays, of course, Saturday nights, we had a uh, wonderful uh, higher monk Ignacy Trepachka, what an unbelievable high tenor. And his, his brother sang with him, Father Anatoly, who passed away, and uh, his uh, two sons, one of them is a priest here at the conference right now, and another one who passed away. Uh, and they used to sing beautifully. And uh, during the week, I conducted the choir, and, I, and it was uh, 1980. And 1980 was the 50th anniversary of the monastery. And there was this wonderful Father Vladimir Sukhobok in the bookstore. He was just wonderful. We used to call him the Krasnaya Solnushka Jodanvilskaya, which means the, the, the bright sun, the Krasnaya Solnushka. And he, I, I came to him, I said, I have, I have this idea about making a record of the seminary choir. I mean, 50 years this monastery was going on and there wasn't a single recording. How can that be? And I said, well, you know, that's a wonderful idea. Let's go to Vladika. So I went to Vladika and I said, Vladika, I'd like to get a blessing to do a, a record. And Vladika's like, how much is this going to cost me? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know, Vladika, whatever it's going to cost. And he says, no, we don't need to do this. And Vladika didn't give me a blessing. I said, well, no, yet, yet. So I go to Father Vladimir and I said, oh, Vladika didn't bless. And that's just what Yimra looks at me and he goes, you start preparing, I'll take care of the bishop. <laughs> do you, so do you I, know what he said to him? Well, I don't know what he said, but all I know is about a week later, I had a blessing. And Vladika did bless me, and uh, Atyas Vladimir was in charge of getting the money to fund it. Uh, and we didn't need a lot of money, of course. Uh, back in those days, I think we did the whole recording for $1,500 or something like that. And uh, we put together a, a, a pretty nice recording, I think. And But we couldn't find a quiet place to record because uh, there's services morning and night uh, at, 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 at the cathedral where we're going to do it. And at this time, uh, right down the road, our, our wonderful friend, Mstislav Rastropovich, uh, the famous celloist and conductor, and uh, he had bought a huge property down the road. And there was an old, old castle. Now it's gone. And that castle had a conservatory room with uh, round ceilings. And there was electricity in there, and we asked uh, to have the recording. So we did the recording in that castle of Rastropovich, and uh, we had a wonderful choir of seminarians and a few monks. As a matter of fact, uh, higher monk Ilarion, the future metropolitan, was singing in my choir. And uh, Father Lawrence Campbell, Father John passed away, and Isaac Lambertson, Father Joseph, uh, many had already passed away now. Uh, and at that time, we were commemorating, of course, Metropolitan Philaret, uh, Bishop Loris, and Archimandrite Pantelaimon as the founder. And uh, Provo Deacon Joseph Yerashchuk, uh, from Utica uh, was intoning Papa Joe. Papa Joe, yeah, my our, the the our great Rokor uh, Pro Deacon, and he intoned, of course, the many years, you know, with the bells. So that was uh, quite an honor to to make. But we had the old thirty threes, so we had uh, the old thirty three albums back in nineteen eighty. There were no CDs. Oh yeah, you didn't have Spotify back then. It was just we had cassettes. So we had printed uh, several thousand cassettes. 
And I remember 5,000 albums. And when the celebrations came, all the bishops came, and there was a big celebration for the 50th anniversary, and we had our first presentation of the film, and uh, they were just flying off the shelves. So uh, Vladika got all his money back, and the monastery made a lot of money. And now I heard they made a CD out of the same recording. I guess you probably already heard it, right? It's also on uh, Spotify. Spotify, Apple, iTunes. Do you know the name of the album? Specific name? Uh, hymns hymns uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church, Holy Trinity Monastery, yeah, uh, 50th anniversary. The, actually, the album is very beautiful. If you've ever seen the album, it's in r- Russian and English and put a lot, a lot of work into it. It was recorded on, on reel-to-reel tapes. I guess you don't even know what that means, but anyway. Yeah, that's uh, like Jurassic era stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. like Jurassic Park start. Uh, years, years ago, that's what they used to record on. You know, nothing was digital, things of that sort. This is 40 plus years ago. But uh, that's the greatest memories uh, was putting putting together all that. And I thank Vladika Loris uh, for giving me that obedience. So every morning, 5.30, I was in church. And I was conducting liturgy at 6 o'clock, uh, five days a week. And then on Saturday, when all the seminarians wanted to sleep, I would come and bang on their doors. And then we'd still have liturgy at 6 o'clock Saturday morning, and it would be antiphonal. I would do the right clitus, and uh, at that point, uh, Harvard Deacon Andranik uh, Kagerov was, was conducting the left clitus, and we always had to uh, antiphonally liturgy on Saturday morning. How did you learn how to conduct? Was it back at home? or You know, I just, I really think um, it's just God-give, God-given talent. I just learned it myself. Uh, I just have a very good ear. My dad and mom sing, my babushka, dedushka, everybody sings. In our, in our, in our, you know, and I'm just grateful that God gave me that ear. And I just pick up very quickly all the podobins and all the tones and all that. I just loved it so much. And with the experience of being on Klita so much, uh, it was just just easy. And then we were traveling with the seminary choir from different parishes, you know, and that was just, just wonderful. And sometimes the bishop would take us with us, and that would be a lot of fun. And then we have a have an opportunity to, to get out of the monastery and have some meat every so often, as, of course, every seminary is always craving for it because we... Didn't in that time in, in those days when I was a seminarian, there was no other trapeza but the trapeza. You guys, I think you have your own kitchen up here. Or something. Dorm yeah. kitchen, yeah. Yeah, we didn't have that in our, in our days. We didn't have a lot of things in our days. <laughs> I heard, I heard. We think we have it tough. Yeah. yeah. So Metropolitan Fleuret ordained me, uh, and uh, in May, uh, on May twenty third, uh, nineteen eighty two, forty years ago, yeah, uh, last year. And it happened to be St. Simon the Zealot. And as you know, probably, this was the young man uh, at the Cana wedding. That was the young man, uh, St. Simon. And when uh, he saw Jesus uh, perform that miracle and of uh, changing the water into wine, uh, he left his bride. Most people don't know this, the poor woman. He left his, he left his bride and followed Christ became a great apostle, one of the 12, and he was so zealous. And Vladika Mitaparit Filaria turned to me and he says, you must be zealous in your faith, and you must be zealous when you serve and be zealous with your people. So I've been trying to be like St. Simeon, Simeon the Zealot, Simeon Zilot. I didn't leave my matushka, she's wonderful, wouldn't leave her. But uh, I've been trying to remember those words of Metropolitan Philaret. So I loved being a deacon. Uh, I was a deacon for my dad for many, many years. And I, I became a, a few years later, I was, uh, started traveling with Metropolitan Philaret uh, before he passed away in uh, 1985. And then Metropolitan Vitari was asking me to travel with him a little bit as a pro-deacon. Uh, so they made me a pro-deacon kind of quick. Uh, and um, I was very comfortable being a deacon. I was able, I was teaching Russian school, I was running Russian school, I was working full time, and Matushka and I were blessed with five children, so we were quite busy. And in those days, you know, I worked a full time job and I worked a deacon. So I was working five, th- five days a week, Saturday, all day Russian school, vigil Saturday night, Sunday liturgy, and then after liturgy, take the kids to the park and at least try and spend some time with the children. But I did that for quite a few years. 
And then the time came that my father wanted me to become a priest. He was getting older, and uh, I was very comfortable being a, a pro-deacon. I was like, well, I don't want to be a priest. You know, maybe I'll just stay as a pro-deacon. We still had, you still had your promise. And I, well, I was already a deacon, so I'm, mm-hmm. I'm re- I was already serving the church, so I fulfilled my promise. Oh, true, true, true. You know, and I was, I was ordained, and I just started to... Uh, not doubt, but I just said, well, maybe I'm just I'm comfortable like this. So uh, and I had, went to Jerusalem that one summer with my brother, and um, there was this wonderful priest there, a very holy man, Archimandit Niktari. Uh, he was the spiritual confessor of the Duns for Gethsemane. And I came to him to confession. And uh, I'm pouring out my heart, my confession, and, you know, this and that. And that's just Nikdari is grabbing his ear. He used to be here in Jordanville many, many years ago. He was the choir conductor, and he also uh, ran the garden and everything. But then he moved to Jerusalem as a, a spiritual confessor. And he listened, and he listened, and I'm confessing my heart out. And he turns to me and goes, No, it is a He goes, Are you done? I'm like, uh, yes, Father, I, I'm done. And then he turns to me, he looks me straight in the eye. And he goes, Peristan gnat Christa. Stop persecuting Christ. I thought I was going to fall and never get up. And I looked at him, I said, uh, and he goes, if Christ is calling you, you answer. And I just couldn't say a word. And then I, I said, I just think that, no, 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 no. Christ is calling you. You answer. Put your head down. And he put his hypothetical over my head and released my sins. And it was just lifted for me. I realized that uh, Christ was calling me. You know. And uh, I came home. I told my wife. And uh, I said, um, and in the back of my mind, I still had just this little bit of a doubt, a little bit of a doubt. And I happened to be going to Jordanville. So we came up to Jordanville. I was serving uh, the liturgy there, but the Kalabad was serving. I was the pro deacon. And, uh, and uh, I went to put the Kafiladet's grave, you know, to his tomb. And I started to pray to Fladika. And I said, Fladika, you ordained me, you know, you ordained me a, a deacon, you know, just. Tell me, what should I do, you know? And uh, I came home that night, and I had this beautiful dream. And uh, I see Bladika. I walk into the sabor of the cathedral here in my dream uh, of of the monastery. And uh, in the middle of the church is a casket, open casket. And I came up, and I see it's Bladika Filariat laying in the casket with his face open. I said, wow, his face is open. And this is what the cafe And uh, I came up to it. And all of a sudden, to my right, Vodika Lavar comes up in my dream. And he's standing next to me. And Vodika Filariat all of a sudden sits up. <laughs> and with his right hand, he blesses Vodika Lavar and me. And I wake up. <laughs> So that was like, oh boy, this is it. Not only did I get a blessing from Vodika Filariat, but he even told me who has to, who has to ordain me. And sure enough, Vodika Lavar ordained me. He was an archbishop then, and he ordained me uh, at the cathedral. He ordained me a priest. So uh, it's, uh, I'll never, I never have any more doubts uh, that, uh, you know, when you pray, you get, you get, you get, your, you get your answers. <laughs> I'm a little bit stunned right now. Like I remember that you, your Matushka Lyubo was telling me when I visited um, your parish that the way she met you actually was quite interesting too because um, she had St. John coming to her in her dream and, and blessing it. And then you have, I don't think, I don't think John Keller and I have dreams like this. I don't, John, maybe you can, uh, yeah. No, I usually forget what I dream about. Well, we're not holy enough. I, I could say my dreams out loud, but they're nothing, nothing of this sort. Um, I, I'm, I'm definitely 
almost envious of, of your, your dedication and kind of not straying off the path. I personally am a type of person that sometimes starts to listen to that little voice that says, a может быть, не надо, maybe you don't need to do this. And it's scary, but, but you have a sense of duty for your parish. And I, I feel to some degree that as well when I come back home and I see there's a lack of people that I grew up with in my church, the young people, they're all gone almost every single one of them. And, and it breaks my heart. You know, everyone has their reasons. Some people say, oh, I was forced into this. Others tell me that, you know, the, the, the church, you know, I've come to know what it really is. Other people say opium for the masses, you know, like I'm smarter now. I know what's the real deal and this isn't it. And a million different reasons. And, and, and it breaks my heart and I don't know how to get these people back in. Have you, how do you deal with a situation like this? You know, my friend, what's the problem? What's the problem with everything going around us? People have become egotists. That's the problem. They think more of themselves and how much they can acquire. Let it be materialistic, of course, most importantly. And, you know, adoring their, their body. And not realizing that all of this is going to end. And one day you're going to get old. And you're going to get gray. And you're going to get fat. And you're going to get bald and everything else. Just I like, hear that all the time. Just like I did. You, you know, know, people tell me not to get old. Yeah, well, that's that what the Galavis always say that. Don't get old. He used to always say that. And to then all, happens. The, all, all the seminarians. And then all of a sudden I wake up and I got this white beard and a bald head. And, and I was like, gosh, I was just a young seminarian here, a young whippersnapper, jumping from clitoris to clitoris and, you know, running after the girls and looking at this. And wow, and all of a sudden, here I am. And you realize how egotistical a lot of us are. And I think that that is really the root of the problem. If we thought more about others than ourselves how beneficial would that be but when we only think about oh i need to rest and oh i need to go party oh i need to go vacation oh i need a new computer oh i need a new car and nah, 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 nah. well then that's all you worry about you don't worry about anything long term you're just worrying about yourself And then, truly, we forget the words of our Lord in the gospel that, you know, seek first the heavenly kingdom and its righteousness, you know. And what are we seeking? We're not seeking the heavenly kingdom. And I cry. I have a, a big school in my parish, a Russian school. And um, it's been for quite a few years, this Russian school. And I graduated it. And uh, our new metropolitan, Nicholas, graduated our Russian school in Lakewood. He, was, he grew up in my parish and his, his, his siblings. And you're right, where are they all? And I graduate classes. And uh, it's, it's so sad. And I tell these kids, I, just this past Saturday, I had this it was a, it was a wonderful class there. And they're graduating this year. I have a big graduating class. And it's a probably the biggest class I ever had. It's like 14 kids. Beautiful kids. I love these kids. I just love them to death. But it's not their fault if the parents don't take them to church. Is it their fault that the parents are not teaching them to be merciful? Is it their fault that they're not fasting because their parents don't fast? And I got that 45 minutes to one hour class with them a week. And I have to make them orthodox and make them love Christ. Wow. I get exhausted, but I never give up. I never give up. And then sometimes years go by, and all of a sudden I get an email. And they'll say, Father, I remember your words. Now I got my own family. And it's so nice. Or they'll call me and they said, I want to get married in the church. I found somebody. They're not living with someone. They want to get a blessing because of what you said in the classroom. Or I want to baptize my child now. And that's the reward you get. 
you know, and you think, oh, thank God I can share that with somebody and, and bring someone, you know, cr- closer to Christ and uh, closer, you know, to their salvation. But I really think it's because of that selfishness and that egotism that all of us are suffering. You know, less of that, I think we would be so much closer to Christ. I I agree. You just brought up uh, something that I wanted to touch on also. You mentioned that there are people that want to get married as opposed to living together. And in the modern world, I've personally spoken with people that tell me, you know, what's what's the point? At this point, marriage is just a legally binding contract. And, and telling them that, you know, there's elements of grace, it just doesn't cut it. They're just like, well, it, you're just locked in now. I might as well have what's called a probne brak. I think someone once came up to a, a Vladika here and asked them for a probne brak, a, a trial marriage that is <laughs> for a few months. And he was stunned. He was like, oh, oh my God. no, you're not getting a blessing for that. But the question is, why? Why is it important in this day and age where, you know, love is, quote, love and, and nothing really, you know, there, there's no such thing as a sacrament, supposedly. Why do people still need to bear in mind that this is so important to get married in the church and start a family in the right way? Because it's the law of God. And we need to understand that. There's a wonderful word in Russian, uzakonich. To fulfill the law of God. If we do not live the law of God, then we are not worthy of Christ. And go back to the Old Testament, you know, go back to the mountain where Moses was getting the Ten Commandments. And there he is up there for 40 days. And what were the Jews doing on the bottom? Ah, he's not coming back. And the next thing, hey, let's have a party. You know, and there it all happened. And you all just, you know the story better than I, right? There it was. Did they stay with the law? And what did they get? There it was. They lost it. And sure enough, I ask constantly, people come to confession. We have a lot of confessions. And I will always ask, are you married? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, are you married in the church? Oh, well, no, but we, you know, we got, went to a judge and the judge does this, and we have, you know, a respisari, as they say in, in Russia, you know. I said, it's not enough. And uh, I can't tell you how many weddings I've had of people over 80 years old because they were never married. And I, they would come and they'd say, well, I said, it's okay, I'll marry you now. What do you mean? Just a few years ago, uh, I had this wonderful, wonderful couple in my parish. And they were celebrating their 90th birthday. She was 90, and he was 90. And they were married for 70 years. Can you imagine? And they went through the war, and they had children, and they ended up in Austria, uh, in that city of Lienz, where the Cossacks were slaughtered by the Brits. If you know about that, in 1945, it was a horrible thing, and sent back to Soviet Union. And he lived through all of that, and he became the Ataman, the leader of the Cossacks, the Kuban Cossacks, in our local area. And everybody knew this, and there's wonderful people, my parishioners. So I said, oh, we're having this big celebration. Uh, so we're going to have a maleben in church and then a, a reception. I was like, wonderful, wonderful, great, great, great. Cossacks came, got their uniforms on. They had their swords outside. Well, they needed a couple of horses. It would have been great. But anyway, and sure enough, all the Cossacks got together. We got a nice big choir. I stood them in the middle of the church like a, like a couple, you know, and we had a wonderful Thanksgiving maleben. And I said some wonderful words. No gaelieta, many years. And then we went across the street to the parish hall, and they're celebrating. It's wonderful. And then the woman sitting sitting right next to me, 90 years old, the bride, okay, 90 years old. And all of a sudden, she puts her head on my shoulder and starts to cry. And I turned her head. I go, Tietje Lisa, what's wrong? Batyushka, oi, batyushka, oi, batyushka, oi, batyushka. <sighs> We're not married in the church. We've been, we just signed, you know, the paperwork and for 70 years ago, but we never had the opportunity to be married in the church. I didn't lose a beat. 
I turned around and said, okay, next month on this date, we're having a marriage. And she looked at me and she goes, now? I said, yes. Oh, well, uh, I don't want my children to know. I said, they don't have to know. You're mature people. How's that going to be? Don't worry. I'll take care of everything. Well, we don't want, don't worry about it. So we ar I arranged everything. I got a clergy choir. We had the clergy the wit as the witnesses. They came to the church, both of them. They stood in the middle of the church. And I placed those crowns on those heads. And I wed them. And I videotaped it. And I said, I want to videotape this to show your children one day with your permission. And it was the most touching wedding I ever had when he kissed the bride and she hugged him at 90 years old after 70 years. And they, and they said, Bashushka, now I can die peacefully. And a year later she passed away and I told her children about this wedding and I showed them that video and the photographs and we just had clergy singing everything was in the cathedral it was very beautifully done and I think this is a wonderful example for many people to understand that this is the way you live this is the way you live you need to live by the law of God go against the law you will suffer and you will fail. And it's never too late. I can't tell you how many couples of that age that I have done. In the 70s, 80s, through my Russian school, I had a, a beautiful family that come and come. They've been coming and children and everything. And sure enough, in confession, I asked them, oh, we're not married. Okay, no problem. So I married the two, the, 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 the papa and the, and the mother. Then the parents came to the wedding. Well, we're not married either. I said, no problem. Okay, we'll take care of you next month. Sure, next month I did babushka and dedushka. And then the other one comes and says, well, my husband is very sick. And he's on dialysis. It's all the same family. But we weren't married either. And I said, that's okay. I'll come to the house. To the house. And I came to the house. You married them in their house. I married them in their living room. He sat in a wheelchair, okay? And she was right next to him. And I put the crowns on and I wed them. And a few months later, I, I buried him. But he was buried lawfully, married to his wife. <laughs> now, has that occurrence been happening less frequently now since the Soviet Union uh, collapsed and Orthodoxy's returned into Russia? Um, or is that still a persistent problem in the church? I think it's a huge problem. Uh, most people coming from Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, most of them are not married in the church. And there's usually one. The ones born here in America, I think they understand better. You know, so we get, you know. But, you know, like getting back to, I think, uh, your question, unfortunately, so many people are, you know, living together first. You know, checking out the plumbing, excuse me. Uh, this is ridiculous. You know, let's check out the plumbing. Let's see if it works. Let's see if we're compatible. Let's see if we can make this happen. What, what, what is this? Oh, my God. What, what is this? The, the, the God, 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 this is not what God wants from us. You know, we truly have to understand, you know, that every relationship, relationship can work if you put the effort into it and you, should, you put the prayer into it. You know, and you really, sh you need that time before you get married. You know, my, my, my matushka, my future matushka and I, we were together for two years. And it was wonderful. So my fiance, that's, that's the time you get to know somebody. And you work it out, you know, and make sure that this is going to be your, your, your pair. This is going to be your, your, your best friend, you know, for the rest of your life. And I'm very fortunate that my matushka Luba is... My best friend. I can't wait at the end of the day to tell her how my day went. And she can't wait to tell me. And during a day, you know, we're getting a little, you know, Texas, you know, Texas and I love you and how was your day and how's this? And, and 
And she knows that sometimes I come home and I can't talk to her. And she knows what happened. And she knows that I just went through like two, two three hours of confessions. And my head's about to, about to burst. And I walk into my chapel of St. Nectarius. I have a little chapel of St. Nectarius in my house. And I just close the door. And she knows. Because I can't say anything. And then all of a sudden she'll, she'll knock quietly and bring in some hot tea and just come and give you a hug. And that hug is the greatest thing in the whole world because I know she knows I can't say a word. <laughs> but that's the, the joy of having your, a best friend as a wife and a matushka, someone that thinks like you, feels like you, and truly, truly wants to help you get to heaven and vice versa. So for the <laughs> seminarians here, and obviously people at home, I'll, I'll get to you guys too, don't worry. Um, they have this type of, uh, you know, they feel like they're not going to find anybody or they're they're kind of rushing into it. Um, and There's maybe a lot of people, despondency and desperacy. That, that's where desperacy. And maybe people home, at home too, or young and, you know, they're at college and all that. And they realize that they're not compatible with, the people at their schools because they don't have the same type of mindset, the same morals. Uh, what do you have to say to them, Father Serge, for my, those people trying to heart, find my a spouse? Heart, my heart goes out to you. The pickings are slim. It's very difficult to find someone who wants to be dedicated to God, to Christ. Very difficult. Um, you had mentioned earlier about my matushka. I think it's worth saying here. Uh, my matushka was going to marry somebody else. And... She was engaged? She was engaged to someone else. Oh, Father Serge came and snatched her. No. She got engaged to someone else before, she, before, before me. And uh, she wasn't certain about this person. Even though uh, he was a PK. You priest know, kid. He was a priest kid. I'm so, I was a P, I was a PK too, peace priest kid, and um, but she said, "Ah, it's that I'm at I'm at that age. I gotta get married, and he seems to be okay. It's this and that." And then all of a sudden, she she started to pray. She started to pray, and when she started to pray, she saw a beautiful dream, and there she saw Saint John of San Francisco. And she saw Vladika standing from afar. And from the left side, she sees that fiancé coming. And Vladika took his, his posach. And he's just <laughs> like this. He's angry. He waved it at her? He waved it at, at, that, at that boy. Oh, at the man, okay. And then she sees from the right side, she sees me coming. And Lodika smiles and gives his blessing. And she wakes up. <laughs> so she, of course, knew. That's a good entrance. That's one way to make yourself so known. I, Hopefully no I, girl has that type of dream of you one day. I have to say, I, 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 I'm, so hap I'm so happy for Vod that Vodika John uh, went to bed for me there. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, uh, it's a hard, hard to answer that question. Most importantly, you know, we are taught as Orthodox Christians to never give up and never despair, never. But don't, take, but don't compromise. Don't just take, well, she seems to be okay. No, 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 no. I do know a few priests who didn't choose well and they rushed into it. And unfortunately, divorce. And that's horrible. And I know a few personal friends and then they had children, and next thing you know, she was not devoted to the church. She didn't understand, you know. And uh, if you think, uh, you know, you're going to have a normal family, no. <laughs> it's pretty tough to have a normal family, you know. And I know I was a PK. I, I grew up, and, you know, my father's always at the church and running around, so it's always mom and stuff. It's not going to be a normal thing where you're going to be, you know, dad's going to be at your sports games or God's going to, you know, it's, he's a priest, you know, we're on call 24-7. You know, there's no 9 to 5 and 5 o'clock don't bother me. 
I can't turn off my phone. Oh my gosh, I, I, I would, uh, I don't know, I just couldn't sleep. What if someone's dying? So yeah, I always have to be ready. I need to go and help this, this soul. And how many souls I, I've watched close their eyes for the last time and, you know, gave them communion. And then, you know, and there's, there's a guy, you know, another one that came, he's on a respirator and, you know, and there's Dubachoshka, what do we do? He's brain dead already. I said, let him go. Let him go. And the whole family got together around this, this dying man and they all said goodbye to him, you know, and then we unplugged him. And he put up his last breath, and right there I said, I served the panyahida. And they cried, and, but it was the right thing to do, you know. A priest has to be ready to, to be there all the time. He doesn't have personal time. It just doesn't happen, you know. If you're going to, you, of course you have to have your time of rest, and you, you, you try to finagle that the best that you possibly can, and that's why you have your matushka. Because she's always that tormos, that break. Oh, come on, you got to get some rest. Oh, you got to put your feet up. Oh, come on. Okay, 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 okay. okay. All, right, all right, all right. Come on, go lay down on the couch. <laughs> get your feet up. Thank God I have her because she's, otherwise I'd probably burn myself, burn myself out totally. But I just couldn't have it any other way because that's how my dad did it. That's how my dedushka did it. And I watched them. And they said, listen, you know, if you're thinking about yourself, then don't become a priest. You know, because a priest, uh, a priest cannot be uh, an egotist. He has to give out from his heart as much as he possibly can and share everything, joys and sorrows and everything with people. And he has to be able to, 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 to hug a person. You know, I, I have confessions all the time and sometimes a person will come in and they can't talk. They're so choked up, they just can't talk. So you just hug them, and they just start to weep. And then you start to weep. And that's a real confession. They didn't even say a word. But they're crying and weeping because they're hurting. And then after they calm down, then you can talk, then you can encourage, then you can give them hope. And all of a sudden they walk out and they got a smile on their face, face and they're so thankful to the Lord for that repentance. And it wasn't you. You're nothing. God did it through you, through the priest. I'm just a pawn. <laughs> I'm just a pawn. He's pushing me around. How many times I, I sit for a couple of days preparing a sermon. Oh, I'm going to say this. And da, 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 I got to write this. Da, 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 da. Oh, I'm all ready to go. Boom. Okay, here I go. Liturgy starts, coming to the end, I receive communion. All of a sudden, wham, a completely different thought comes into my head. And all of a sudden, that sermon just went out the window. I come out and I give a whole different new sermon. And all of a sudden, a person's coming up to the cross. Pachushka, I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that. Thank you so much. You just changed my life today. I did that? God did that. God knew that Mr. Ivan, whoever, was going to be in church that day. And he had to get to his heart. So he sent, this, he sent that message to, to my head. And sure enough, that's how God speaks through people. You know, and that's the awesome feeling of you know, really being a priest that, wow, you have absolutely no control over your day. You just never know what's going to happen. I wanted to ask you on, on behalf of that, actually, that, that theme, um, uh, what, a concluding question for tonight. How do you discern the will of God? How do I discern it? Yeah. How do you, for example, sometimes you're presented with several options and you're not really sure what to go for. It can be anything. For example, you're trying to buy a car or you're trying to find a good spouse. You're talking to several people or you're trying to buy a house. Anything, literally anything, even vocation. How do you discern God's will? I remember Valdika Filia's words, and he said to me, remember, the soul lives in your heart. Your heart controls your thoughts. Feel with that heart. Your conscience is in your heart. 
It'll never let you down. And I feel that way. And at that point, I cross myself, I pray, and I go forward. I make that decision. But I need to feel it. If I don't feel it, I'm not doing it. I have to feel it. That's very well said. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for being on our show tonight. I, I really enjoyed this. This is probably my favorite episode. Something just went pranikla, как говорится. Well, I'm just so happy, really happy to be here, especially on this Jubilee, as we, you know, we entered into this 75th anniversary of our beloved seminary here. And you know, I've said this I said this several times that truly I spent three years here. And uh, back then it was a five-year course, but when I came to the seminary, I was already a reader and I was singing and reading and I, I knew already a lot. So Vodikalava allowed me to go to the third, right into the third course, you know. I went to three, four, five. And um, I always say that was the best three years of my life. The best three years of my life. Because all I had to worry about was prayer, studies, and obedience. And that was it. And I had two obediences, besides the usual cow barn at that time and the kitchen. And uh, you guys don't have cow barns now anymore, but in our days they had a large cows here, about 50 plus or maybe 60 plus cows. And I had uh, I worked in the Piri Plyotnaya. In those days we used to make the covers for the books. So I learned to make the covers for the books and the gold prints. And, and then Vodika put me in charge of Kliras and... Uh, doing the, you know, the, 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 the seminary choir. So I was very blessed to have those wonderful ob- obediences here, you know, and those three years were just magical for me, you know, and even though most of those fathers are, are all gone, there's not too many left, uh, when I was here, their spirit is here. It's embedded in these walls, in the ground, in the trees, uh, you know, this 90 plus years They're all around us, you know. And when you go to the cemetery, and maybe you didn't know that man personally, but uh, venerate those crosses. Say a prayer for those monks by name. Uh, you have so many wonderful, wonderful saints laying in this cemetery and wonderful metropolitans and bishops and holy men. And, of course, most uh, now recently, of course, martyred Joseph Munoz Cortes, who... Uh, I knew personally, and he come to he would come to our house, and we, you know, the Mer streaming icon, the Montreal icon. You probably never saw the Montreal icon, right? That was no, it was probably, like '99. Yeah, probably yeah, when, yeah, when she yeah. when she does. Of course, the Hawaiian now has replaced uh, that icon, but that is a, is a holy grave there, you know. And you should go there and, and serve Panihidas there, you know, and or, or Parastas, or just read a canon, and just talk to him. You know, he's truly a, a wonderful, wonderful man. And all of that grace that we have here at that, that Holy Trinity Monastery uh, and the seminary, uh, I'm just so grateful for receiving that because that was truly my foundation, you know, for, for, for my life and uh, becoming uh, the man that I became. And um, I hope that God will help you as young seminarians. And uh, most importantly, not to despair. Not to despair. Не бойся, малая стада. Do not be afraid, you know, small flock, you know. And Jesus only had 12 apostles. And look what he did, you know. And look where we are now. And Christianity is all over the world. And orthodoxy is so strong, you know. That богатство, that treasure that we have. Oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness, how how rich we are, you know. But what happens is that we, you know, we take it for granted, you know. I'm cradle orthodox, you know, I was born orthodox, you know. Uh, and I don't take a single day for granted. I'm just so thankful that I'm orthodox, that I was brought up, you know, in a nice Russian orthodox family and priests and everything. I couldn't imagine my life any any which way. And for those people who, who leave that and they run after the world, eventually they get tired. 
And then they get tired, they get exhausted, and then they start realizing, wow, what I had. And they can start coming back to those foundations and roots. Just like the prodigal son. Exactly, exactly. And they hopefully can repent and come back. But always, we always leave the door open for them. We never condemn any soul. And that's the most important part of the church. You might leave, but you can always come back. Please come back. Please repent. Please be with Christ. And I think that's what we have to understand all of us, that we always have that opportunity through Holy Confession to come back, you know, and to receive again that Holy Spirit. Спасибо очень. This is a wonderful conversation. Пожалуйста, it's a wonderful, wonderful joy for me to be here. And hopefully we can uh, get together again. God willing. God willing. Mm -hmm. Okay, God bless you all.